Well, while guns continue to kill people in the U.S., cancer is running amok in virtually every country. It is the second leading cause of death globally. Cancer kills some 9.6 million people every year. Every one in six deaths globally is a cancer death. I don't think this is something I need to stress upon. We all know someone who has lost his or her battle to cancer. A lot of us have lost family members to cancer, parents, brothers, sisters, cousins. And that's why it becomes news and big news when there is some hope that a cure for cancer could be found. Breaking this news for us is our next guest. I couldn't be more delighted than to introduce you to Dr. Siddharth Mukherjee. He needs no introduction at all to most of you. Dr. Mukherjee is a cancer physician, he's a researcher, a Pulitzer Prize winning author. His book, The Emperor of Maladies, has really taught a lot of us everything that we, that we know about cancer, where it came from, what its origins were, and how it can be fought. Joining us now from the United States, Dr. Siddharth Mukherjee, welcome to the show. But Dr. Mukherjee, I have to say you taught many of us everything that we know about cancer thanks to the Emperor of All Maladies and, uh, uh, of course, the Song of the Cell. Uh, if any of you haven't yet read it, you really should be reading those books. But before I come to any of those books, uh, Dr. Mukherjee, and talk about them, I really want to talk to you about your startup, about Immunil, a little bit. Now, you seem to be doing this path-breaking research, interestingly, out of Bengaluru, right here in India. And it sounds as if you're getting closer and closer to a cure for some of the cancers that people thought were uncurable, like leukemia and lymphomas, after chemotherapy has been tried and failed? So, um, first, thank you for having me on. Um, let's begin the conversation with Immunil. Immunil is a company that I co-founded with a couple of other founders. And the idea was to bring cutting edge cell and gene therapies to, to cancer. Now, Cell and gene therapies don't apply to all cancers, but we've had over the years in the United States, including work from my own laboratory showing that you can actually have a market influence on cell and gene uh, on leukemias and lymphomas. Now, uh, remember that these leukemias and lymphomas, Vikram, are the, are, are the cancers that ha are no longer responding to standard chemotherapy. So in, in, in some ways, these are, they are called relapsed and refractory. Relapsed because they have relapsed after standard chemotherapy and refractory because they are no longer responding to standard chemotherapy. So their prognosis is very dim. In other words, they will, if they were given no other therapy, there's a 100% chance that they will die from, that, from this disease. And it is often spread all over their bodies. Um, Typically, the leukemias, this is a particular form of leukemia called uh, BALL, um, B acute lymphoblastic leukemia. You don't need to know the details. But the more important thing is that it affects young children. So children age 8, 9, 10, it goes up to 20, 25, and there are certainly some rare cases. So these people have a whole lifetime ahead of them. They've already gone through two to three years of very intensive chemotherapy. And generally speaking, about 85%, maybe, uh, you know, give or take, are cured by this therapy. Cured as in the leukemia will never come back. This is one of the great successes of chemotherapy and oncology. The problem is what to do with the 15% that's remaining. And in a country of 1.3 billion people, that 15% can add up to a very large number because, you know, even if you take 15% of a very large number, you end up with a very large number. So um, we and others have devised a, um, a T-cell therapy, a T-cell based therapy that can achieve, um, and I use this word very cautiously, that can cure these people, these 15% of these remnant people who are no longer responding to standard chemotherapy with um, these T-cells. It's an extraordinary complex process. T cells have to be extracted from these immune cells have to be extracted, genetically engineered and re-infused into, into these people. And we've seen some really miraculous results that we presented at, uh, at, at, at you know, scientific meetings uh, that people, you know, really blew people's minds away. Now, I just want to make sure I understand all of that. So I'm going to go over it again syllable by syllable so we all get it now we are talking here about some of the worst types of cancer and where the therapies that you are working on start to come in are on people who've tried everything else and nothing has worked so they are facing almost certain death 
that's where you are trying to do what you're trying to do. So what percentage of those people are now responding to the new treatments to CAR-T uh, and how, what percentage of them are you being able to save? So we've now treated about six, uh, I would say 15 to 16 people on a, on a trial. The trial numbers are necessarily small. This is not a vaccine trial that's going to have to 24,000 people. They're only 15 to 16 people. And that's the international standard. That's what the standard that the FDA and the European authorities use. Now, the success rate has been on the order of 77 to 80% of those people. Um, we have judged them. Uh, the standard criteria is to look at day 90. So three months after their, at least three months after their treatment to see if they have any disease left. And the answer is in those three months, they've had complete remissions, no evidence of disease. We will do another assessment at 180 months. There are some kids, obviously, you know, this is a rolling trial. There's some kids, um, one of whom I met, who's now 240 days out of their therapy um, with no evidence of disease left. So again, technically almost a year, let's say about nine months. Um, obviously we'll, we continue to follow. So around a 70 to 77% uh, rate. There have been, I mean, there will always be, this is a very risky therapy. Um, there will be, um, as with the FDA, as with the European authorities, some patients will actually have a terrible, will have a bad reaction. So we are very, what we're very watchful of these reactions, but given everything, given the totality of lymphomas and leukemias, we've had about an 80% uh, complete response rate in uh, in leukemias and about a 70 odd percent in lymphomas. And when I talk about response rate, it's, it's what's called a complete response. You don't see any evidence of, of disease left. And that total number comes out to be at 77 to 80 percent. So 77 to 80 percent cure for people who are facing certain death is a very high number. So just to understand what it is that you're doing in chemotherapy, you are essentially but poisoning the entire body, hoping to kill the cancer cell before too much death is done. Now, these being liquid tumors, you can't actually operate on them in any way. So what you seem to be doing, if I understand you correctly, is you're extracting the blood from these patients, treating it in some way, genetically modify, modifying it, and then injecting it back so it can go and kill the cancer. Is that a correct way to look at it? So there are cells in your body called immune cells these cells, their function is to kill um, other cells. And usually they kill cells when you have an infection. So let's say, I mean, I'll give you one example, when you have influenza and perhaps even when you have COVID, um, these cells called immune cells, they're called T cells. These T cells go and kill the cells, the natural cells in your body that are carrying the virus. And that's their function. We and others have learned that you can actually change the direction of T cells and redirect them to not to kill virus infected cells, but if you genetically engineer them, you can kill cancer cells. So um, the way that's done is that the T cells are extracted from the body and then they're genetically engineered in the laboratory, then they're grown in the laboratory and until they reach a certain number. And then we give three infusions on day one, uh, day three and day six, three infusions and we monitor for about 28 days to make sure that there are no adverse effects. And then we do a repeat scan and then of course we follow them on day 90, day 180 and so forth. Now you were saying you're really doing this on people who have not responded to chemotherapy or to anything else that was done to them. Um, wouldn't there be a case though, because look, let's face it, chemotherapy does involve a lot of damage, damage to the body. And you're talking about children for whom two years or three years of chemotherapy could mean considerable suffering. So why not try this first? Why not first try CAR-T and see if they may not need to go in for chemotherapy in the first place? Um, so we are very interested in trying this first. And if we did that first, it would be a path-breaking trial. It would change the I would say would change the entire world. Um, we're very interested in doing this first. Um, and we have the capacity. India has the capacity to, to deliver this first. So in other words, change the paradigm around. So instead of a child going through two and a half years of chemotherapy and radiation, you know, try this first and then give them a much lighter dose of chemotherapy. It makes total biological sense. It makes total medical sense. 
Um, it will only happen, of course, if we prove the safety and efficacy in the trial that we're doing. But, um, but to remind you, the standard chemotherapy, although it's effective against children with ALL, the standard chemotherapy will cause all sorts of problems. So there will be, obviously, there'll be psychiatric issues, two years of in, spent in the hospital. You can imagine as a six-year-old child, it's almost as, your, as if your life has been destroyed. Um, there are growth stunting issues. These children don't grow um, because of the uh, chemotherapy. There are, there's a loss of cognition. So they, there's um, a, a documented loss of um, their capacity, that sort of their brain capacity, I would say, um, which is permanent. So they will grow up with some loss in cognitive capacity. Um, in contrast, this therapy that we've um, pioneered in Bangalore, along with several other people, um, we're standing on the shoulders of giants. This therapy allows them, potentially if it was given first, it's a three-day infusion, and if they don't have a reaction, um, they, it basically it's tolerated just like a blood transfusion. Um, almost no side effects, and then we can follow it up with chemotherapy. So, Dr. Mukherjee, if you're looking at cancer as a whole, and we're talking about a cure for, uh, for cancer, you're applying your techniques in a certain type of cancer, ALL, right? Lymphonas, leukemias. But can therapies like this also be used for other cancers, which are also considered a death sentence right now? Stage 3 or stage 4 pancreatic cancer, for example. And the other cases of cancer where if this could be used and used successfully, then 8 years or 10 years from now, we may have a situation where we are saying we've cured cancer. So um, the answer is yes. Um, there are two kinds. There, there are many other blood cancers, including cancers that you may or may or not have heard of. Um, unusual, not unusual, I would say, lymphomas, um, such as uh, uh, diffuse large B cell lymphoma. It's a cancer that's actually growing very rapidly in the in the Indian population for reasons that we don't know. Multiple myeloma, another cancer very common in the Indian population. Um, if I remember correctly, there every year there are about forty to fifty thousand new cases um, of multiple myeloma. Now, for solid tumors, so the ones I talk about are liquid tumors. For solid tumors, um, this particular variant of of T cell therapy, for reasons that we partly understand, doesn't seem to work as well. So we are trying modifications of this T cell therapy, and in fact, the, in the Immuni Lab, just be very clear. Our laboratories are not just sort of making medicines. We have a very strong research team. That research team is looking at pancreatic cancer, ovarian cancer, cervical cancer, endometrial cancer, and trying to make what, what we call second generation T cells or second generation cell therapies that will attack and potentially kill these other cancers. They have been very difficult to deal with. Um, but um, there's a lot of hope. We have a lot of variations of this theme different kinds of cells, different kinds of genetic therapies that will attack these cancers. All right, Dr. Mukherjee, thank you so much for joining us. We're going to be keeping a close eye on that particular uh, trial and, and report the results on that.